All right. All right. So, you know, welcome everyone to ASQ Harrisburg uh, meeting tonight. Um, uh, as Chad said, my name is Tamela Sorensitz. Um, I'll save a little bit of uh, my background and bio for toward the end. Nobody wants to hear about me tonight. We want to talk about um, talk about quality control. Um, I've titled this the the latest in quality control, but um, we're going to focus on statistical process control tonight, and um, that's actually something that's been around uh, for almost a hundred years now. Uh, Walter Schuhart back at in the 1920s at Bell Labs was the first to kind of put out some papers talking about controlling processes statistically. And his, his seminal paper uh, on, on control charting in particular was um, put out in 1924. So <laughs> it's, we're coming up on the hundredth anniversary. Uh, but, you know, anything that's been around for a long time, for a hundred years has had, you know, the opportunity to be misused, abused, poor implementation. So um, I'm just hoping that tonight, maybe we could put, uh, you know, a fresh set of eyes on this old tool and um, maybe see how, again, this can help in today's manufacturing environment. What can we do with quality control, st statistical process control today? So what is SPC, statistical process control? And just as the name describes, it's st using statistics to monitor and control a process. And basically the idea behind it is that it will help provide an early warning and, uh, and allow you to use some tools to prevent uh, the process from starting to go out of control or start to create bad parts. So this early warning through SPC allows you to take actions before you start making bad parts. So why is that important? I mean, besides the obvious, um, you know, you're, you're identifying these potential defects in the early stages of your manufacturing process, not just at the end, you know, when you're doing your final inspection, but, you know, if you have this implemented correctly, you're taking measurements along the manufacturing process. It helps reduce scrap and, and rework and other forms of waste, which, you know, that's going to go ahead and save the company money internally. But then if you think about it, that because you're catching uh, problems early, you have less of a chance of a uh, bad part getting out of your production facility and to the customer. And ultimately, you know, your customers are going to be increased satisfaction there. So, so how, how does it work though? How do we actually use SPC in practice? So tonight I do want to focus on one of the simplest and commonest SPC tools, which is control charting. And these, uh, as I mentioned before, these help you visualize the stability of the process. Um, stable processes show up on a control chart as a series of just random points with no trends and no outliers. So why don't we take a look at, at, at the simplest example here? So first, um, let's just say uh, we're a manufacturer of metal tubing and uh, our customer tolerances are somewhere between five and seven millimeters um, for, for the, the diameter of that metal tubing. We take measurements on that metal tube every 15 minutes. The, the tubes coming off the line every 15 minutes, we'll take a measurement and we plot those measurements on a control chart in time order. So that's you know, the basics of control charting. The red lines that we see here on this control chart, those are the control limits and the yellow lines are the customer specification limits. Um, so whenever there's points that are exceeding the control, the red control limits, that means our process is not stable. That means the, the variation is, is too great um, for, those, for those points that exceed it. Now the yellow lines, the customer specification limits, uh, when you exceed customer specs, then you're, you're not a capable process. You're not capable of meeting the customer specs. So uh, some folks might cringe at looking at this graph because there is some controversy uh, when you put customer specs on a control chart. Um, so I'm actually, I'll come back to that later and address that. But for now we have them there just, just to kind of illustrate this example. So, so anyway, so we can see we have uh, uh, an unstable process. It's not capable of meeting customer specs. We have points out, out of control here. 
So let's say we go back, we make some adjustments to the process. We collect measurements on 15 new pipe diameters and we plot those on our control chart. Now um, we can see that we do not have any points outside of the red control limits. So that's indicating that our process is stable, but those control limits are still wider than the customer specification limits. So um, there is one point highlighted here that's outside of the customer spec, but we could actually expect many more than just one point to go outside of the customer spec limits because the natural variation in this data as indicated by the width, width of, the, of the control, the red control limits is wider than the specs. So that's really, it's not good. We might be stable, but we are not capable here. So then you go back and, and you do, you use your engineering knowledge, you do your root cause, your five whys, you make a, a change to the process and you take some new measurements. And then, you know, voila, you, you are within your red control limits and they've tightened up, right? They're, they're now inside of the yellow customer spec limits. So that's indicating that your process is, is stable, but it's also capable. And once you have a stable process, you can actually measure that capability with some capability statistics like CPK and PPK. And um, generally you're looking for the, in this case, if, if we're showing the CPK here of 1.388, you generally want that number to be higher than 1.33. And that's, that's an indication that your process is capable of meeting those customer specs. Okay. So that was, you know, as I said, simple, quick example, um, but there are actually several types of control charts um, out there in the wild that you can choose from. And, um, and tonight, I actually want to focus in on the, the top five control charts used for continuous type of data. So what do I mean when I say continuous, right? Um, Continuous data are generally measurements that you're taking on the part of process, which, you know, when you think of measurements, those are like numbers, right? But not all numbers are continuous data. Uh, you can think of uh, an example here would be when you take a survey and they ask you to choose, uh, you know, between one to five, whether you, you like the product or you don't like the product on a scale of one to five. One to five, those are numbers but they're, they would not be considered continuous numbers because they're essentially what they're doing is they're categorizing, right? They're, they're grouping the responses. You know, here's all the people that chose a one and here's all the people that gave it a five. You're not, uh, nobody's giving a 1.5, that's not an option. So generally uh, continuous data is, depending how sensitive your measuring device is, the continuous data can be measured to an ever finer and finer degree of accuracy. You know, one, 1.1, 1 1.01, 1 1.001, et cetera. They're doing crazy things with nano measurements now. We're getting down to, you know, measuring, we can measure the diameter of a proton in the nucleus of an atom. So, you know, <laughs> we're getting really fine degrees of measurements, but those, that would all be considered continuous data. So let's focus on those uh, tonight, those control charts for continuous data. And let's start with the most common control chart. So an individual's chart is, as its name implies, this is each point on this chart is representing one measurement of soil pH, and they're plotted here in, in time order. So the first truckload is the first point, the second truckload is the next point, right? So the, the center line at, the, at the, the center of the individual's chart is the average of all those samples that you see represented there. So we have 30 points on this, this eye chart, this individual's chart, and the, the center line is at the average. Now, uh, then once you have the center line, you can plot the upper control limit, UCL, and the lower control limit the LCL. And the calculations for those are, you take the average, and let's just focus on the upper control limit. You take the average, 
and you add a K sigma. Sigma is represent that's the statistical um what was it Greek let the Greek letter that represents in statistics the standard deviation of the data. So the standard deviation generalizes or summarizes the amount of variability that you have in this data set. So the standard deviation of these 30 points, um, and, and if you have a low standard deviation, that means you have less variation. So that's a good thing. That makes the line come closer to the center line. You, you, get, you tighten up your control limits as your standard deviation or variability decreases. So um, the K then, the, what you're multiplying your standard deviation by is chosen by you. You can have one standard deviation. You can put these control limits one standard deviation away from the center line, two standard deviations, or three standard deviations. And by default, and, and in most cases, uh, the the control the k value is generally set as a default of three three standard deviations um but generally uh the point here is that i'm trying to make is that natural variability can generally be captured if you have a, a normally distributed process 99.7 percent of the points that we would plot on this individual's chart would be captured within the upper and lower control limits. We would expect that that 99.7% of the points would fall between these two. Okay. So the you know the the assumption here whenever we do an individual's chart is that we have stability between our measurements, between our pH measurements here. And that's this the stability between the measurements is assessed using the next control chart or the second control chart I want to show tonight, which is our moving range chart. Okay, so here's a moving range chart. Uh, this chart is used with, along with whenever you're looking in, in an individual's chart, you typically want to take a look first at this moving range. And you want to make sure that this chart is stable before you start assessing your eye chart. Now, the plotted points here on a moving range chart are a little bit different. They're not just the individual points that we saw on the eye chart. These are representing the difference between each measurement of pH. So, for instance, the first point there is the difference between the first pH, the first 500 tons of pH, or 500 tons of sand pH, and the second 500 tons of sand. So, just kind of looking at it in an Excel kind of way. So. On our eye chart, the first observation that was plotted there was 7.52. And the second point that was plotted was 7.54. The difference between the, the absolute difference between those two is 0 0.02. Okay. So, so the 0 0.02, that's what's getting plotted on your moving range chart. Um, and so just doing a quick little math there, you're always going to have one point less on your M your moving range chart than on your eye chart, right? So if you have 30 points on your eye chart, you're only going to have 29 on the moving range. So, um, and then also, you know, just like our, our individual's chart, the center line here is plotted at the average of all those moving ranges. And, um, and here our, our control limits are actually a little bit different. Um, the control limits are the average of all the moving ranges multiplied by D3 and D4 is what they're represented by, but those are what are called unbiasing constants. Um, these values, the D3, D4 values, they actually come from a table. Uh, and because of the way the average moving range standard deviation is calculated, it is considered a biased estimator. We won't get into that tonight. Um, that's a little outside the scope of this talk, but um, though, in general, we use those val those unbiasing constants to determine where the control limits are for a moving range chart. Now that I've um, I've addressed that, you know, the the eye chart and the moving range chart are for our first two control charts. Both of these charts, they assume that the data is normally distributed. 
and I, and I, I think I mentioned that before, but not all processes are normally distributed. So, you know, what do you do? What, what other options do you have? So this is where we can actually um, leverage statistics and um, maybe take a look at what's called the central limit theorem and, and maybe use this as, as a way to, uh, to help us along when our data are not normally distributed. Uh, the central limit theorem uh, is basically the idea that when you in, independently take random samples from a population and plot the averages of those random samples, the averages follow a normal distribution. Even if the underlying distribution is not normal, if you take those averages of the random samples, the averages will generally follow a normal, you know, bell-shaped curve. Okay, so we can take advantage of that, um, you know, when we're when we're collecting our data in what's called rational subgroups. Okay, so rational subgroups um, are basically, you know, you're it's rational because you're you're taking measurements in groups based on a certain, you know, time interval that makes sense for that process that essentially the time interval uh, captures that those measurements are being taken under the same conditions. So uh, for instance, a, a high speed stamping line, you're going to take samples at a different rate than maybe um, a slower uh, glass blowing operation or something like that, right? Um, and generally your control plan is, is going to um, identify for you the timing of those quality control checks, okay? Okay, so here, here's an X bar chart. It looks exactly like the individual's chart, okay? It's, it's, the difference here is that each point represents the average of those five wheel locks. So here we have 20 points plotted, and because we're taking five every hour, that's representing 20 hours of measurements, but underlying this are 100 individual wheel lock measurements, right? I go too far. Yeah. So, so the the center line here on an X bar chart is the average of the averages. Okay. And uh, the name X bar might seem a little funny, but if you look at you look at the little image there, we have an X with bar with another a horizontal line over top. That's in statistics. That's the symbol for the average, right? So that's why it's called X bar. Um, so we plot the the center line at the average of the averages. And then our control limits is the average of the averages, plus or minus usually three standard deviations. Um, but here, in addition to our red control limits, you can see I have uh, plotted there those yellow uh, customer specification limits or tolerances, right? So remember this, I had mentioned earlier, this is the controversy. Uh, when you put spec limits on a control chart, and especially when it's an X bar chart, remember I said that these points are the averages that represent all 100 points. If we were to actually plot all 100, the chart might look something more like this. Okay, so the, the blue line there in the middle, that's plotting, you know, it's connecting all the averages and that's staying within our, our upper and lower control limit. Um, but notice how the individual wheel lock measurements are getting outside of those control limits. So what, what this represents here is the variation within those subgroups. Some individual points are outside the control limits, but if you think about what if I had put the spec limits on here, are some of those, are some of those wheel locks outside of the specs, right? So that's why there's a little controversy here it could be misleading to put customer specs on a control chart. You know, so that being said, uh, you know, what are, what are we doing here, right? Uh, we have to take a step back and remember what, what, is S, what is the point of doing these control charting and what is SPC? The idea here is for in-process monitoring, monitoring the process 
and being alerted to changes ha happening in the process. It's not that end of the line inspection tool, right? So we have to monitor the variation that's, that's actually happening within the subgroups. So since, since we can't really see that variation here on an X bar chart, we can get a sense of the, the variation that's happening within those subgroups with, with the last two control charts. I'll, I'll, I'll group them together because they're both kind of used interchangeably here with the X bar chart. Uh, and those are the, the range and the standard deviation chart. So, so just like we had to do a moving range chart to see what was the difference um, between measurements for when we had the eye chart and we needed to make sure that that was stable before looking at the eye chart, so too we wanna look at our range and standard deviation charts before looking at our X bar chart. Now, typically the range chart uh, you're going to use that to assess your within group variation if your uh, size is less than eight. And for standard deviation, you use that one when your sub when the measurements that you're taking in each one and averaging together when that uh, you have more than eight, eight or more. Okay, so that's typically what's done as a standard. So, so let's let's kind of quickly take a look at the range chart. You know, this is plotting ranges and a range is just simply the difference between the largest value in the in the subgroup and the smallest value. So that's kind of represented here. Uh, obviously, ranges that have a longer line have a greater range between the, the smallest and largest value. So that's plotted on this is now what your range chart would look like. Again, very much like your uh, moving range chart but this one's plotting the, the ranges within that subgroup. The center line again is that average of, of all the ranges. And here, here again, we have our unbiasing constants for, for that, um, for plotting our, our upper and lower control limits. So, so when the sample is greater than eight, again, we're gonna look at actually the standard deviation that captures the variation in our subgroups a little bit better. Um, and so when you're looking at standard deviations, just like range, um, the, the green box here has a smaller standard deviation and the red box has a larger standard deviation. Um, and it's just, you know, how much variation you have in that subgroup. And so you, you plot that standard deviation here on, on the chart. So the interesting thing that I see here on this standard deviation chart, uh, and I talked about you have to make sure that your within subgroup variation is stable before looking at your, your X bar chart. The interesting thing that I notice here is that the last you know five or six points that we have on this graph, they're not outside of the upper or lower control limit, but they're they're highlighted or flagged red. And that is because these points are actually violating another of the control chart rules, not just that they exceed three standard deviations from the center line, but a control chart rule that helps us to detect, detect patterns in the data. Um, you know, what we might be seeing here, maybe because the points are going up and down, Maybe this is some diurnal effect. You know, we took measurements at night and then in the morning and at night in the morning, you know, day, night, day, night. Uh, or maybe it's bimodal. Maybe we accidentally took measurements from machine one and machine two, and we have those, both those in the same data set, and we're seeing some sort of a, a bimodal distribution here or something like that. Again, that's where you're, you're going in, you're using your knowledge of the process and you're doing your root cause and trying to identify where's this pattern coming from, right? So, um, so that being said, there are more tests besides uh, test number one, which is highlighted here. Test one is outside the upper control limit. There's other tests that you can run. There's actually eight of them. Um, and, and it's typically, typically when you, you do not have a stable process, you want to start by just flagging points that are outside the control limits, just using test number one. But once you're, you're, you're getting those 
uh, points all within your control limits, that's when you want to start turning on maybe a few of the other tests to look for other types of patterns. So here you can see, obviously, test number three is one that's that's highlighted and looking for points that are steadily increasing or decreasing. Um, six, in this case, test three is six consecutive points in a row, increasing or decreasing. Um, test four is uh, similar to what we just saw in our standard deviation chart where we have consecutive points alternating up and down. Um, so there's a few different things that you can look for with, with the other control charting tests, okay? But that's just more of an awareness, so you guys know that that those are out there um, and uh, and available for for pattern recognition. You know, after you have the stability, after you've gathered your data and you've you've um, understood all your sources of variation coming into the process, that's when you can compare your customer specs with your process and do things like capability analysis. Okay. So, you know, once you do that, go ahead and trumpet to the world that you have the highest quality product that you helps you keep your customers happy, but then it also can help you it like in Craig's case can help you win new business. Um, you know, so that's, that's the ultimate goal uh, of statistical process control. Um, and just, a, I thought just a really good story. And I, and I hope you guys, um, you might even have some stories like that. That, that you've heard of, so. Uh, okay, so that's kind of, uh, you know, here we are at um, a quarter, quarter after eight, I'm showing on the clock. So I just wanted to, you know, just address the fact that uh, this presentation, all the images of the control charts, those came from uh, a software called Trendable. And that's actually uh, the software that my, my startup has developed uh, I actually worked for Minitab. I'm here in State College, Pennsylvania, and, which is the headquarters of Minitab, in addition to being Penn State. <laughs> um, many, I worked at Minitab for over 10 years and heard that uh, many of the customers just needed some simpler tools. So I went out and teamed up with some of some other former Minitabbers, and we developed Trendable. Uh, we actually have, have two apps of Trendable. One helps with the data collection piece. So if you have manual processes where you're using, you know, hand gauges or scales, helps gather that kind of data you, that you don't already have sensors already collecting. Um, and then, and plots those on control charts. And then also, like we saw here in the presentation today, the control charting and capability statistics um, to help, you know, plot your measurements uh, and, and understand your, your process capability. So, um, thank you everyone for having uh, me out tonight to, to speak with you. Uh, I did put out a blog post within the past week here uh, called top five SPC control charts. And, uh, if so, if you go to the link there, go trendable.com top five SPC control charts, that's kind of the heart of this presentation. So, um, that that kind of covers the the meat of the stuff in the middle. Not so much all the the cool stories, but um, but the meat of it is there.